we're going to be talking about a gallery show in San Francisco at the Analog Gallery. And Don, that's your gallery. Uh, what should we all know about Analog? Oh, great. Um, Analog SF opened in April of 2019. And we are a community-based gallery that focuses on primarily local artists um, living in the Bay Area. Um, and we have a variety of programming. It, the gallery itself is in a refurbished old garage from an 1890s Victorian building. So um, it took us about three years to convert the stinky garage into uh, the white walled gallery that you see today. Um, and um, like I said, our emphasis is uh, on programming that is for folks who don't you know, who don't subscribe to the normal gallery system per se, or who couldn't get into the normal gallery per system, but people who um, maybe have never shown before. We love to promote folks and show folks that have never exhibited their work and kind of help them along uh, with that process. It's really fun. Um, yeah, so, so, and that's our big call to action today is gonna be encouraging people to go to the gallery. We are at one o'clock and I think we should get started. So um, this is Art Viewing Adventures, hosted by Community Living Campaign. And Nikki, tell us about the Community Living Campaign and kind of how we fit in. Hey, Rodney, thank, thank you. you. Hi, welcome everybody. We're the San Francisco Community Living Campaign. We're a nonprofit in San Francisco that serves San Francisco seniors and people with disabilities. And we uh, have exercise programs in person and most of their programming is done via Zoom. So we have writing uh, groups. We have other programs that are about your health and other information that's important to these communities. So we mail out this beautiful calendar every month or you can get it online. Um, and we wanna share that with you. So if you want to, you can put your email in the chat. We'll send it along to you. Um, and we are approaching Latino Heritage Month. and. Um, I'm actually gonna be hosting a couple of those activities, including um, the Latino Book Fair, and we're gonna be bringing on labor leader and also photojournalist, um, David Bacon. So look in your calendar so that information coming up. And we're really happy you're all here today, having such a great group of artists together. Thank you for being here. And uh, Rodney, thank you for being the host again. Well, thank you, Nikki, and I'm really pleased to be joined by some some good friends of mine, uh, fellow guides at an unnamed, we call it the um, San Francisco Unnamed Museum of Art, or SF UMA, uh, and um, even though we won't tell you their name, um, they are located downtown near the Montgomery BART station, and known for generally having newer art, uh, so maybe that'll give you some idea who we're talking about, but um, Faruja, Fred, Gerard, Nick, how are you guys doing today? Very well. Yeah. Thank Happy you. Yeah. And these guys are all in a gallery show at the Analog SF Gallery at 886 Cap Street, which is located very close to the 24th Street Mission Station. So just around the corner. And they're, it's going to be open Saturday from 12 to 5. So we really want to encourage you guys to go. Some of these works we talk about, you're going to want to see in person. And I'll just give you a, a, a sense of the gallery. So um, this was the opening that uh, was uh, about a week, a little more than a week ago. Uh, so a bunch of people went and you'll see that we went, we were, um, you didn't have to dress up super fancy. We were on a camping trip. We actually um, left our tent and took BART into the city from uh, a campsite in the East Bay Hills. Uh, and then uh, we had a great time looking at all these artworks, some of which we're gonna be showing you on this program. And then here I am again. You didn't even have to shave to go to this thing. That's how <laughs> that's how informal it is. <laughs> and just everyone had a great time. And if you are able to go Saturday, I think you're going to really have a great time too, experiencing this stuff in person. But we're going to give you some stuff to think about when you look at this art. So here is the group of artists, minus one of them, Verena Lucas, is in Europe right now. Um, so they let me kind of fill in for them, even though I'm not actually an artist. I just just do this. So we're going to start. Um, Gerard Boulong, how are you doing today, Gerard? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me today. And Gerard, you, you've been a guest on this program before. 
So we've talked about some of your works, but you have lots of new things you've been working on. And um, I, one of the things that's intriguing to me is um, that the, these paintings are all the same size. So they, they're all, you, you seem to like that format. Is there, is there a reason, what, what do you like about doing a square? Well, I always love square. And, and it's funny because when um, um, Instagram start to have the square uh, uh, format, that was perfect. I love square because human, when you look at an image, when it's square, your eyes always go directly into the middle of the painting. And from that, you are kind of going around. It's you, it's you never lose the, 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 the vision of the image. Contrary to something rectangular, you tend to go all around, you're looking for something like a red or blue or light, and, and you, are, you can let yourself lost into the image, not with square. Square is almost like, like an easy way of observing and, and, and looking at an image. And so I love square. So all my art, 90% uh, square. <laughs> and it reminds me of uh, another artist who loves square art was uh, Agnes Martin. So that, that's kind of cool that you both share that. Um, hey, Gerard, do you mind if I read your artist statement? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. So this is on the wall of the gallery. Gerard says, I create work that starts with an original photo mounted on canvas. I then apply acrylic or pastel in order to interpret the image and convey something beyond the original photo. In my works, I explore landscapes, portraiture, current events, figures, and abstraction. And we'll take a look at a couple of these. So... So you said you start with a photographic image and then you paint. And I'm always thinking like, you know, okay, is it a painting? Is it a, is it a, a photograph? Um, would the correct answer be yes? <laughs> yes. And then like, oh, yes, like what percentage? Like, okay, if I, if I had to force you to put a number of, um, you know, what percentage of this is a painting versus a photograph? So, um, to answer your question, it's all depend about the subject. Like this one is obviously more like a photo than uh, a painting, but they are um, like the one of um, I did with uh, Queen Anne is mostly more abstract. I mean, that when I decide to, to, to use a photo, 99% of my art photos are for me. Uh, I, I trying to deconstruct the image mean that I will trying to forget about what I'm about the image and focus more about the color, the, the, uh, the idea I want to uh, convey instead of trying to reproduce the image that I'm seeing it. This one is a little bit different because during the time of COVID, I did a lot of hike and I observed that there are a lot of things that I, we walk uh, on the top of it, like flower and grass and the rock, but we never look at because it's so little and so insignificant. And I, I decided to focus about the little thing of every day. So I zoom into a, a, a corner of some white flower. This is uh, at a Jenner uh, um, a headland preserve. And, and, and make it bigger and trying to, to give those flower um, a, a credit to exist. And I enhance it and I make it those yellow to be a little bit more yellow, red, because a photo, uh, you sometimes you kind of lost a little bit. And, I'm, and also I try to make it a little bit more um, uh, fun to look at because I simplify the color and you can see it. It's, 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 there are some dominant color and some color is a little bit, uh, um, 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 how can I say it, a little same, same tone. So I kind of interpret in my own way, but still it's a really, uh, obviously is a photo. Good. Can, I, uh, can I insert something here about your picture? Yes. You have uh, four paintings in the, in the show. Uh, of all of them, I think that one, the one you've been talking about, is the one that really invites and encourages very, very close attention. 
you know, really close looking because you take things that are small and you make them very, very large. And when we see it, that we realize that you had to pay very close attention to their shapes and colors and so on. So I think this is an invitation to pay attention and to look at the world around you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we want, yeah. want to show this one. Um, so it's another one that really gives you a sense of the, um, first of all, three dimension out three dimensionality of the these um works um by the way the pen is just in there to kind of um the pen is sold separately <laughs> and uh it, it it just kind of gives you it's not part of the painting but it kind of gives you a sense of like what we're looking at here yeah give uh, you a little bit of proportion and the scale of the painting so here you can see it it's it's a photo but i decided to completely ignore the photo and, and i add a completely uh uh colors that, that that's uh, inspire me almost something a little bit more like a magic something like surreal because you don't see flower red like that and yellow like that and, and branches look like a you know look like a real form of moss or anything but uh that's the way or sometimes i i i go to that direction and trying to be a little bit more abstract than something uh, um, um, um a visual um, um figurative yeah and this one um, I have to say, like, you you really want to see this one in person. Um, I think it looks, these things actually look pretty good on Zoom, but in person, um, the sharpness of it is just extraordinary. And you told me, Gerard, this is the one you spent the most time working yeah, on. Yeah, this one is really probably the most uh, care and love uh, <laughs> in my art so far. So um, um, 2019, I have a chance to go to uh, Japan. And, and visit the, the Imperial Garden in Kyoto. And I was impressed so much about the forests of the bamboo. So if you go there, uh, I hope one day you can see it. So it's gone entirely covered with bamboo and the bamboo when every time you have the, the, the wind who blow the bamboo, it's almost like they are talking to each other and it's amazing, it's so magic. So I, I decided to make a painting to uh, homage to, to that view but I also want to create an image that also give an homage to Asian art, because like, you know, Chinese or Japanese art, they use all of silk and they will paint on the top with a brush and always have technically a lot of black and white. You don't have anything else. So when I walk with this picture, I have to eliminate everything that's gray. So it's almost, um, mainly black and white, but contrary to the watercolor that the, the Asian um, art is doing, I create three dimensional to this because all the black you see is a layer layers of, of acrylic. And I, but this one is not abstract because I have to respect all the, the shade, the form of the, of the branch and the leaves to recreate the, 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 the forest and I saw. Yeah, I really, really love this one and definitely want to encourage people to go check it out. We do, we, we're trying to get six different artists in. So Gerard, thank you. We're going to move on. Thank you. Here's another picture of Gerard in front of these square works. But Nick, um, let's talk about um, some of your works that are in the show. And this one, that, by the way, the show, if you go and look at the, um, the, the publicity for the show, you'll see this, this uh, sculpture in it um but this is a, you know it's it's a sculpture with these how many different lenses are on this uh, uh nick oh maybe uh 18 or 19 it's actually depending on the number of tubes that i could get inside the larger tube but it, actually before talking about this one i'd like to say something about the cutlery set can you hop forward to that we can do that there we go so I think that you'd all agree with this, and that is that over the last three years, the, the most uh, uh, sweeping and universal experience that we've all shared is COVID. And if you think about the nature of COVID, it is natural in the sense that it is a naturally occurring virus that leapt from animal populations into cities, human populations. And uh, it's a it's a thing that is neither nature nor culture, but both. And I was trying to, I made this during the first months of the COVID uh, pandemic and the shutdown. And I was walking in parks and looking at what was underfoot. And what I'm trying to show here is the dialogue that we're always involved in, 
constantly in a conversation with nature and the manufactured handles and the natural branches are what I'm trying to use to express that dialogue. Yeah, and we have this close up of one of them. And um, yeah, so that, that one's up on the wall. I do want to go back to this one because I, I really, it was really fun. And I think we got some uh, photographs that um, there's one that you took in particular. So it's, it's fun to like make photographs through the lenses. This is my favorite. Um, but you look at this sculpture. My question that I was asking everybody was um, if this thing wasn't a work of art, if you actually, if I told you it was an actual apparatus that had use in the <laughs> real world, what would it be? What would it be used for? And I'm just curious if anybody, you know, anybody in the audience wants to unmute and, and share their thoughts or you want to throw it in the chat. Yeah, just go you ahead, Paco. The three folks, uh, branches of trees, the ones with the uh, slideshow. Can you go back to your uh, PowerPoint slide, please? Like that one? one. Or are you talking like about the uh, cutlery? Literally like a branch of trees. Are you talking about these? Trees, like a branch of trees going back. Uh -huh. Oh, there uh -huh. you go. Well, it is. It is interesting, like it because it's it's something that's natural and yet something man-made, also, right? Yes, Rodney. And then thoughts on this sculpture, what it might be if it was a real-world apparatus. Um, Peter and Kevin say it looks like eyewear lenses. And, and the thought I had was like, maybe this is actually glasses that you would wear, um, you know, if you're a space alien on a planet where you have like 20 different eyes and, and you might think that's ridiculous, but, you know, I, I noticed that our, um, our phones are, are getting additional lenses. Like they're up, some of them are up to three and maybe, you know, five years from now, they'll all have 20 different lenses. And, um, you know, this might be maybe some species have evolved to have the same sort of thing going on. Let me bring uh, Don into this conversation, because when the five of us, the six of us were in the gallery trying to decide what should go where, uh, which paintings, which objects where, Don suggested, contrary to what my initial thought was, Don suggested putting that piece in the middle of the room and elevating it somewhat so that it could be at eye level and people could look through it rather than at it. Oh, that was Don's idea, huh? I think it's a, it's a great idea because, because I do think of this, all of my work as tools, as tools for thinking or organizing your thoughts. Um, so to be able to look through this is a really important part of it. And uh, Don, do you wanna say something about that? Yeah, I love our little conversation we had in the gallery too. Uh, and I love how you said it's, sort of like an apparatus for viewing and it's meant to look you're meant to look through it not at it necessarily uh, so it does have a beautiful face you know it has a sort of where all the lenses are sort of facing you it's got a beautiful frontal face such as that but it's fun to walk around it in the round and see how it changes as you're looking through the different lenses and what you're viewing and you get the magnification of certain areas and and we had we did some fun playing around with like looking through it, uh, photographing each other, and your eyes are a little distorted, and maybe you're smiling, but it's like way down low in one of the lenses. It's a lot of fun. It's a really fun, fun uh, piece. This is another reason why whatever your plans are on Saturday, you need to cancel them and come to the Analog <laughs> Gallery and see this show. Um, also, want to show this other work that you did, uh, Nick. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what, it, what you know, what do people make of this? What are we looking at? See if there's any thoughts in chat, or feel free to unmute and share a reaction you would have to this work. I have to tell you, Nick, um, it does remind me a lot of uh, Rene Magritte in some of the works oh. we saw in the Magritte show a few years ago at at SF MoMA. Mm -hmm. I love Magritte, and I thank you for that comparison. Oddly, I hadn't thought of that, but it, it really does, it, it, there is a connection. I'm sure Magritte influenced a lot of artists and poets. Yeah, he, he's, um, 
you know, his footprints are, his fingerprints are everywhere. Maybe his footprints are too. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, this is great. And um, I, I'll ask you some of the other artists, what were you, what's your reaction to this? Anybody want to jump in? Some, oh, Sarah says, it looks biblical to me. Okay, which Old Testament or New Testament? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, when Nick first described this photo, he used the word tree hugger, which is kind of, you know, a natural <laughs> reference. But the hugging of a tree implies that the tree is something other than you. Whereas this suggests that the tree and you are one. And I think that's what's really magical about this image. Yeah, and I, I love, the, I think it's a great black and white image. You know, like this wouldn't work in color, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the black and the white, the monotone combines the forms into a single unit. And I think Fred's point is exactly right. It's, we are totally integrated with nature. And this, by the way, was done at the same time I was doing the cutlery. So um, oh, wow. it, the, it's the same story in a different medium. Yeah, and it's interesting. A lot of this work that we're seeing really are influenced by the pandemic, um, you know, and our reactions. And if we go think about where our heads were at two years ago, um, kind of an interesting context, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we should keep moving on. It's This is kind of hard to like squeeze all this into an hour. All I can say is I would love to have you guys back and do individual programs on your on you and your work. Now, um, Verena Lucas is in Europe right now. She could not be with us, but I think Don, you were going to talk about her works. Sure, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll speak on behalf of Verena since she can't be here um, as one of the artists in the show. Um, well, um, Verena is a photographer, and not only that, she loves to photograph people. Um, I'll read this real quick if you yep. want me to read. Yeah, go it. ahead and read that. Sure. Uh, from her own, from uh, in her own words, she says, my photographs are chance encounters with people or places at a certain moment in time. I'm trying to create a document of urban life. I aim to get more than a face. I want to show an expression that gives a small insight into their lives that creates an emotion in us. And what I really love about Verena's work is that, uh, you know, she brings us closer to strangers on the street through her intimate uh, portraits of folks that she greets and befriends. So she she doesn't just take their photograph on the street. Like some photographers will do that, but Verena is different in the sense that she will go up to the the people and sort of befriend them and ask, and get to know them a little bit and then take their picture. And I think that there's a, quite a big difference in the result of doing so, is that we get a real glimpse into you know, the emotion in the photographs. Um, there's a connection with the people. They're not just subjects, but they're people and she gets to know them. And then she transfers that to us, which is real magical quality. Yeah, and just, you know, like this this one, the contrast that she gets, like just the lighting on it is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, and then like you know you're like well who is this guy the, the, she, she can tell you the stories behind these people yeah. and then um her inanimate objects um her street scenes of buildings and store windows are really interesting too the way she chooses to uh, frame the subject it's fascinating yeah yeah it's oh like, um, um, well i should say one more thing um we're going to see a little bit of Fred's work in which color is like a really important component. And, and it's equally important in Verena's work, except she does an interesting technique, which she doesn't shoot black and white, although you may think that some of them are black and white. But what she loves to do is desaturate the strong colors so that you get to see the details. So there's almost a silvery or shiny quality to her level of desaturation. Desaturation meaning taking out some of the color. So um, it almost looks black and white, but it's this has got a hint of color. Um, question from Vivian, did she put makeup on her subjects? And I'm thinking the answer is no. No, because... oh, I, I, 
I think she's photographing them. And, and I think Marina really likes uh, pageantry on the street. So she likes to go to Folsom Street Fair or Castro Street Fair and photograph the people that are out there to be photographed, that kind of want to be seen um, in, in, in a large part. And then some uh, unhoused folks that she befriends and really gets to know, you know, and then brings this to us to see. I just think it's pretty amazing. I wonder what kind of cigarette this is. The, the heat Probably Asbury guy to me has one. to know. <laughs> I'm assuming it's a hand rolled one. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then I, I have to say, I, I one thing I just really noticed about this this last one, um, th what, whatever's going on, I guess these are just eyelashes, but it looks really, um, you know, otherworldly. I would say, kind you know, of angelic and uh, very moody. The, the 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 feeling this person has is um, exuding. Quite, it's one of my favorite images of hers. I, I just love it. What do you think if if we said that she was um, kind of a latter day Arbus? Would you think that would be a um, comment that she would like? Oh yeah, or even a Vivian Meyer, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, and, yeah. In the sense that Arbus befriended a lot of her uh, subjects of her portraits, for sure. Yeah. So, so you know, there was always that side of like I'm showing you the image, but the backstory of the photographer getting to know and gaining the trust of his or her subjects, you know, that that's something that. And, and if you know Verena at all, you'll know that she can carry on a conversation about anything so well. <laughs> I mean, she she is a splendid or I mean, she just. Um, I just have so much fun talking with her. She's, All right, she, you've, you've convinced yeah. me. We have to do a Verena Lucas show for Art Beauty Absolutely. Adventures. Absolutely, I think uh, she would love that. Tell her, like, yeah, tell her she's been um, drafted. And I guess I imagine she is doing a lot of photography right now while she's in Europe. She's in Germany right now, which is her country of origin. Anything else we should add on Verena? Just that, yeah, I think her, her, her subjects are primarily people and then architecture. And um, in fact, one of the pictures that's in the show that is, she said is one of her favorites was taken in Germany and it's, it's a wild perspective. Another thing is that she only shoots with her phone. So she shoots with her iPhone and, you know, the best camera that you have is the one that's on you. And I really think that she takes it, you know, to the limit with her phone. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, you know, I didn't include it, but the other architecture photo she has is one taken from the Salesforce Park, which is one of my tour, uh, my walking tours that I do. And, um, and, and it's really magical. Like she convinced me that that park is just a great place to take pictures of architecture. So Verena, I hope your ears are burning. I suppose it's pretty late where you are right now. Um, sorry, you couldn't join us, but let's move on to Fred. And Don, I think you were... You were going to ask Fred some questions for this section of the program. Oh, that's right. Hi, Fred. <laughs> Hello, Dan. <laughs> um, as far as questions, um, I what I just, well, in the curatorial statement for the show, not to take up too much time, but what I really love about Fred's work is, um, well, Fred, you can read that if you want. This is sure. Read or paraphrase well, it. I would preface this statement, so listen to it through this lens, if you would. Verena and I take very, very different pictures, but I think together we're uh, probably a good example of how different taking pictures in our urban environment can be. So we're both on the street, but we're seeing different things, processing them differently. Her series is heavily people. This particular series of mine has no people in sight but it's still literally the streets of the city. So I could read that, Rodney, if you would like me to. I've always been attracted to the surprises of urban landscapes, whether it's patterns, abstractions, or small details. I like to find ways, often unexpectedly, to portray the not so obvious in our environment. If I'm lucky, 
themes will emerge on my walks that become the inspiration for a new series. And let's let's take a look at some of these. So what I did in this series, and maybe Rodney would be a good idea to kind of show the ones you have as I talk about them, so I, because they kind of collectively fall under kind of an umbrella. So I was out uh, basically on an assignment um, for class, and I was walking in the Ocean Beach area uh, out of the city. And there's some really interesting houses out there, extremely, extremely different architecture. But there are, were a few buildings, this one right here. Uh, a lot of people know this building when they saw this, these photos and said, oh yeah, I know that building. Well, it does stand out out there. You can tell from the, uh, the, the colors alone. And I wanted to pick out details uh, in this house and some of the other pictures I took that almost made abstractions out of what we just walk by and look at and sort of take for granted. So obviously, you know what you're looking at. There's no uh, um, intention here of creating an abstraction, but to kind of take it a little bit out of its a normal um, way of looking at it, to see it differently, especially in terms of colors, perspective. And so Verena, uh, Don was explaining, desaturated colors. I did something a little bit different here, a little bit related, which is to kind of, in my processing, overexpose them to kind of take away the literal reference of the colors and make these places just a little bit more abstract and play with shapes and shadows and things like that as a result. Yeah, you have a story actually about this particular photograph, um, putting it in the show. You mean about the processing? Yeah. Oh, well, Talk about that. <laughs> well, it, uh, during the hanging of the exhibit, we had a, just a minor accident with one of the frames breaking and the print being slightly, slightly damaged. And Don, who's a great photographer, suggested that when I reprint it, I put a little bit more color back into it, not quite as washed out as the original, which I did. The focus on this particular image is not great, but the color is what the new print turned out to be. And I think it was a great improvement because you get more of the bands of the blue operating uh, separate from the white. You get more contrast between the light and the sort of the, the, the darker shades in the image. Yeah, and the focus, uh, when, when you see it in the gallery, you will see it fully focused. It's really, it's really this zoom image that we're losing a little bit on. Yeah. And then I, you know, I had to ask you with this um, kind of, um, this, essay about color in buildings. Um, if you're an Ellsworth Kelly fan, and you said you are, and so what What do you think of my connection between this sort of work in Ellsworth Kelly? Well, Ellsworth Kelly is certainly more abstract, but he certainly knew how to work color and shape uh, and patterns. And uh, I, I wasn't thinking of a direct influence when I took these pictures, but I can see the influence now. Um, yeah, he just I wanted to go back. Uh, go go to the one of the photos with the staircase, if you would, Rodney. Either the first, one. Okay. Let me go to this. We well, got this staircase. Yeah. Okay. So the one there's two photos that have staircases, and to me they imply a little bit of a story because you don't know where that staircase goes, and the other one it almost looks like it could be going to heaven. It almost gets washed out the higher up you get. And so there's sort of this anticipation of, well, who's going to come down, who's going to go up. Um, so I just was kind of playing with the sort of an implied story with these particular images. No people in them, but maybe people suggested. So are you a Led Zeppelin fan? I will say yes. You have to tell me what the connection is. Yeah, stairway to heaven, right? Oh. Jeez, it, I, which I of these two stairways would be the stair? I guess neither one, right? Because that's a pretty dark song. <laughs> <laughs> it would not be illustrated with this one, I don't think. Different, different pop song about stairways, I guess. Um, so, what what will be next for you, Fred? What what's your what? Do you have another urban subject that you're? Um, I want to get sort of get away from this sort of look. I want to really start to think about getting people in my photos more. I mean, I have taken photos definitely to have people, but usually in a setting that suggests some kind of architectural thing happening or perspective happening. I mean, I love photos where there's uh, something going on in the foreground with a person and something in the background. There's no connection between the two in terms of what's going on, but visually there's a connection. 
And I like that sort of interplay between foreground and, and, and background that only the viewer is able to see together and make a connection between in reality, you know, they're, they, they're unaware of each other even. Oh, and so that makes me think of um, Lee Freelander because he, he likes uh -huh. to do that. Uh -huh. And, and by I the mean, way, some of my very favorite urban photographers, that's what they're masters of. So if I can even, you know, begin to incorporate some of that into my photos, I'd be very, very happy. Yeah. And Fred, I want to, t I want to tell everyone, you're, you're one of my friends I love going to the Pier 24 gallery with, and we will be doing a show on um, the new Pier 24 gallery um, exhibition uh, in early October. So, so that'll be coming up yeah. on Art Doing Adventures. Um, thanks, Fred. This is it's great to see this. You're very welcome. Thanks for including me. And a, just a quick shout out to Don for this was his vision to put this show together. He made it happen. It was a really special thing for all of us. So thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, Fred, because I have to say for all of us who are associated with SF MoMA, this has been a real morale booster being able to celebrate the artists in our midst. We'll move on to Don, and I am going to have a question at the end for all of the artists. I, I've had something I've been thinking about that I'm going to throw at you guys. So, um, but before we do that, Don, you are um, the, the one of the two um, co-operators of the Analog Gallery, and uh, but you're also a photographer yourself. And you will see we've got three photographs from you that, that we're going to show. And there's a couple more in the gallery. Um, but Don, I just have to say this because it's such a great lead into the show we're going to be doing in two weeks. Um, we're going to be talking about Robert Bechtel, a man who loves showing cars in front of houses. And uh, I just if you'll forgive me for asking, um, do you share my love of Robert Bechtel? Oh, indeed. I love Bechtel's work, um, especially his Potrero series when he lived in Potrero Hill, which is kind of not far from where I live now. And uh, I know he since had moved to Alameda, where you'll incidentally know that there are a lot of covered cars. There are more covered cars in the East Bay than there are in the city, I think, because people have much more room out there than maybe a second car or whatnot. Um, but I just, I was talking with Nick about how I love, like, uh, I don't really, I think he asked me, like, do you know what kind of car that is underneath the, uh, underneath the veil, right, Feruse? Underneath the veil. Um, <laughs> it's all hidden. coming together. Um, it's peeking out. No. Um, and I, and I don't know the answer to the, those questions. Like, I don't know what kinds of cars they are. They usually tend to be old classic cars, probably like that are, that are being covered and stored outside hardly ever driven, but I love the mystery of the, the white walls peeking out from under the tires. And then I did something interesting in this series where I mirrored, I, I, um, I did the negative of the uh, traditional composition shot, um, such as the blue car. If you flip this physically and chromatically, you'll get the opposite of the blue you'll get the orange. And what I found doing that process was I discovered really interesting details with foliage and cracks and fissures that come to the foreground when you invert the color. You, you, you find really interesting details that you might miss just looking at quote unquote normal color. So I had a lot of fun playing with the uh, positive negative of the series. If only Robert Bechtel could have walked into your gallery and seen this. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> I think I would fall over. If he yeah, did. wouldn't it be cool if he did uh, something like this of Alameda <laughs> Grand Torino? Yeah, I feel like I got the angle right on this car, you know, especially. It's very Bechtelian. <laughs> it's so cool that it's at a diagonal, right? That not that like yeah. an essential element of this? Yeah, and it just happened that that sky matched that blue. I really didn't saturate this much. That is um, Laguna Beach skies in beautiful Southern California kind of weather with the puffy clouds. But you can tell that I didn't do too much saturation enhancement because the Bougainvillea is actually a little undersaturated, but um, I didn't tweak it too far. But I do take liberties like working with color like Fred as well. and. Arena. I think we all, as artists, must play with our color and figure out where we want it to land, you know? You, you know, one thing I just noticed is that the cloud here, 
when we when we when we um do what do you call this kind of the negative version of the image yeah it, the inversion it disappears that's pretty amazing well, oh it's here it i see black. it's black yeah yeah, yeah and, uh, nick you had it i mean i remember you and i were talking about this and you said um something like you know this is a uh, um robert bechtel on acid or something <laughs> I don't know. Again, I know what, what he. Sadly, we lost him a, a couple of years ago. But That's right. we're going to be talking to in, in um, two weeks. That'll be the subject of our program. And I'm going to have um, as my co-presenter someone who lives in Alameda, and she's made a point of going and finding some of the houses. Oh, wow. And she's wow. even met some of the people that live in the Robert Bechtel houses, and we've gotten to talk to them. You know, Don. One comment about the, the comparing these two photos is that. The original one, the car obviously is very grounded. And this mm. one, it looks like it's just about to float up and be like a balloon. Mm. You know, it has no weight. Mm. Yeah, interesting. I like that. And so Don, what's next for you? Uh, you know, I have not given up my obsession for covered cars. So every time I see covered cars, I break out my camera. I don't know. I'm I'm interested in the billowy, the hidden, the mystery underneath things. So whether it be a trash bag or a car cover or any kind of drapery, um, I'm I'm there. I'm really interested in should, it. Should we um, be calling you if we see one? Would you want yes, to? Yes, like, please let me know. I'll I'll bring my camera over and <laughs> there'll be a hotline or maybe there'll be some yeah, kind of Twitter. We'll you can tweet at our hotline. Oh yeah. I'm sure I, I'm, I'm going to see. This is the thing I love about. Um, this is one of the things I love about Bechtel and in, in these is that in, in, in what you did, Fred. Also, it's going to make me really notice some stuff mm -hmm. that I probably would have just walked past. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's one of the great things that photography does is gets us yeah. to look at our world differently. Nick noticed one. He sent me a picture, very cool, of a nighttime scene of covered cars, which looked very mysterious at night. Yeah, it looks like a shrouded night. I mean, you could easily imagine transfer this to the use of shrouds over bodies after they've, <laughs> yeah. Well, the East Coast and I thought, well, maybe these are people speaking of bodies in the witness protection program, <laughs> and they're just trying to keep a low profile so that uh, you know the feds don't come after them or something. Or, so or, the, or not the, the feds, but their uh, their former associates. Oh, this is the vehicle protection program. Right, right. Oh, very good, very good. So here's the question I have for all of you guys. Um, so we've been, we've been, you, you guys are all museum guides. You've all spent, you know, many, many fun times um, taking people around museums and talking about the art that we're looking at. What is it like for you to be on the other side of all that, to now be the subject? of um you know like you you were in the gallery with people looking at your works and then asking you questions and so what is it like when the tables are turned on museum guides i very much enjoyed being in the gallery and it was because i could as i am as we all do as museum guides ask questions about uh, people's perceptions what they're seeing how they're responding why they're feeling this way whatever Except this time, the subject of the question is my own work. And since I've been isolated, like all of you, in terms of art exhibit for years, it was a real treat to be able to uh, interact with people, not just around my art, by the way, but uh, um, being a museum guide with the work of the other four artists. It was really a lot of fun. Yes. I didn't really experience it as being that different. I just see it as uh, another form of the conversation about art mm -hmm. and overhearing conversations uh, that people had about other people's art, my being engaged in conversations. I was engaged with conversation with people about other people's art. To me, there wasn't like a big distinction between any of that. It's just all about observing together and coming together and figuring out together and enjoying together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Like we, we, you know, it's what we love to do is, is be together and talk about art. And, you know, many of the museums that's not happening right now, uh, it still hasn't started. So this gives us an opportunity to do that. And of course, what better subject than the work that you've been met engrossed in this whole time. 
So, it's, so that's good. How about others? Um, Verena, uh, Gerard, you have thoughts on, on that kind of role reversal? You're on mute, I'm sorry, or, or on mute. Faruja or Gerard? Um, well, I'll step in. You're new to me. You're on mute. They can't hear you. <laughs> no. No, they, sorry, that, that's Fred I, talking. I'm sorry. I mute myself. And <laughs> so we're, we're, we're going to hear from Faruja and then, then you, yeah, Gerard. Okay. Okay, Go ahead, sorry, Faruja. Gerard, I didn't uh, notice. Um, in this particular case, I actually, because there was a certain personal connection um, between me and the art, as much as I didn't want it to be, but there, you know, there was. I uh, found it in in this particular case, it was actually easier to uh, talk about other artists' arts rather than on on this particular set. Uh, maybe if the nature of it was different, I would have felt uh, differently. But uh, I. Uh, in a sense, every time I told the story it was a, a bit awkward for me, like, um, I wonder if they would uh, realize it without me telling the story or not. So, uh, so that was the only hesitation I had. Because your, your work is very personal. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like you're, you in your mother's uh, veil. Yeah. <laughs> So, so uh, Gerard, what are your thoughts on um, now being on the other side of the uh, equation here? Well, my art is very tedious and very isolated and very, uh, um, um, how can I say, um, very alone. I, I am myself in the studio hours and hours. So having a show in the gallery is almost like an open window so I can, you know, can talk more about what I'm doing. It's, it's a very important because um, uh, being an artist or being a musician, you cannot just paint for yourself or you play your music for yourself. You need an audience. So having a show, it's, a, it's a good for me. And, and actually being a docent for many years kind of helped me a little bit of, um, uh, of uh, because I'm very timid, I'm very introvert. So talking, it's not always easy for me. So being those and kind of helped me a little bit to, uh, uh, to be out there and talk about it. Yeah, it's a different skill set that you know we ask of artists when um, we're together in the in the gallery and, and looking at your work. And I, you know, I, I would find it pretty intimidating because people are looking at your work and kind of judging it, and you're right there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you're out there, you have to be prepared about rejection. You prepare about, you know, something, say something not positive about it. So, yeah, it's uh, it's <laughs> it's like a performing a little bit. So. <laughs> and what's what's going to be next for you, Gerard? What's what's your. Uh... Well, you know, uh, uh, the COVID was a little bit heavy for me. Um, and with what's going on around the world and everything. So right now I, I've, I've, I kind of discovered nature. I thought I, beauty of nature inspired me and make me forget about a little bit what's going on out there and, and, and focus more about what is important in life. So look at a flower and trees and rock and stuff like that, make me more joy. So that's what I'm doing now, find joy in, in nature and forget about all the bad news out there. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Nick? What's what's next on the agenda for you? Uh, I'm uh, finally getting around to making a website to display my work, and uh, that's that's pretty satisfying. I've been doing it last week, and we'll do it uh, this week, and it'll be done. But I'm also doing some work uh, again with. Uh, addressing technology and how, how technology lands in our lives and what it might look like to archaeologists in the year 5000 AD. And, and what it would look like if you had 20 different eyes, right? <laughs> that's, true. that's the question I'm left. That's one of the questions I'm left with after seeing this. Um, and then Faruja, what, what, what are you going to be working on next? Well, uh, you know, I have quite a uh, collection of photographs that I've taken. So uh, 
when I find time, and I say when I find time because I'm trying to wrap up this project that I've been working on for some time, and it's a actually translation of Edward uh, Edward Munch's journal uh, to Persian, um, because I found out last time that uh, the uh, young people in Iran are very uh, connected to art and for some reason, particularly to Munch. Uh, he's very well known amongst uh, people and the and the younger generation. So uh, that's what I'm putting most of my uh, time into. It's almost there and uh, pass it on to the uh, publisher and everything else that follows after that. And then go back to what I have. And uh, I also have a neighbor who is a, uh, she's a uh, theater actress and she is a wonderful model. And I like to take portraits and she is so natural and I don't have to tell her what to do. So I'm going to start working with her some and taking some uh, portraits. Well, cool. Hopefully, we're going to be seeing more of all of your works in in galleries, and um, it was so much fun to be able to go in and go a couple times and spend time with you guys at the Analog Gallery, which again is located on Cap Street, right around the corner from Twenty Fourth Street Mission Bart. And also, it's important to say for the Community Living Campaign, um, very good access. Uh, if you're using a mobility device, it's got a ramp that you should be pretty pretty easy. It should be pretty easy to negotiate. Um, Don, am I am I right saying that this would be a good place for people to visit if they're using a mobility device? Oh, indeed. Uh, it's got a gentle slope, but it comes right into the gallery. I'm not sure what the degree of angle is, but it's it's not too abrupt. It's a nice nice slope into the gallery, and then we also have. A big back door that we keep open so there's a nice breeze going through the space most times yeah and some of you know we are you're seeing pictures of us not wearing masks but sometimes people were wearing masks if that's what you want to do you'd feel very um welcome to do that again no need to shave before you go especially if you're <laughs> camping in the east bay hills as i was i'm so grateful rodney that you um that you came out um even though you were camping um, I'll have none of that, Don. Yeah. We're so grateful to you. This was like just the the, the breath of very fresh air. As I'm soon as I, I I got as you, Don, you know, as soon as I got your email, I like immediately got on the phone with you and said, "Hey, we got we got to do this thing on um, Art Viewing Adventures." So I was thrilled and about anytime, that. Anytime you want, we're we're available. Cool. Well, we'd love to do more shows with all of you guys. Um, it is two o'clock, so I think I should turn it back over to, um, well, before I do that, just any last words from the artists, anything you guys want to want to throw out there before we um, turn it back over to Nikki? I just want to say it was really a pleasure to work with the other four people doing this, and I think that really was um, something I didn't anticipate, the, the joy of the collaborative uh, experience. Cool. Um, well, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining me and working with me on this program and uh, look forward to lots more good stuff from you guys in the future. 